Hello. Welcome to Backstory with Joan Goldstein. I'm Joan Goldstein. For the past couple of segments of my TV shows, I've been focusing on older citizens and how they're coping with this very changing world. Today we're going in the other direction. Today I'm going to be interviewing a young person, a millennial, in her 20s, who was, I'm happy to say, once my sociology student. And she is now a student at USC in California. Her name is Natalie Calabat. Natalie, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. It's an honor to be here. I'm so happy you could make it because you're going to be leaving in a couple of days to go back to California. Yes, I am. Right. Indeed. One of the interesting things, well, there are many interesting things about Natalie, but one of the interesting things is that she is a um, swimmer, a com I'm sorry, competitive, you were a swimmer, you're a competitive diver. Yes. And you've done that for several years now, haven't you? Yes, for about 11 years now, and I'm on the University of Southern California women's diving team now, so it's pretty awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you even, we even have a few pictures you gave us of you diving into yes. uh, the waters. Like a, <laughs> From like, 32 feet <laughs> up, it's ooh, crazy. <laughs> ooh, I was interested. The other day I introduced you to someone we were talking, and they asked you, uh, wasn't it uh, scary or didn't it scare you? And you were so terribly honest. You said, I'm a human being. Of course it's scary. Yes. And I thought, I like that. Very candid, very, very true. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is really, uh, what does the world hold for you as a millennial? You can't speak for your whole generation, obviously, but as you learned in my sociology class, all individuals are part of a larger world, a larger right. society. So what do you think are some of the issues for, for your generation? Um, naming a few of the issues for my generation would be technology. I think technology is advancing and People have to learn to cope with the technologies today, but ultimately social interactions are very important and they're actually very important for the older population as well. It helps them put off dementia and Alzheimer's and ultimately live a healthier lifestyle. So I think, I hope that technology doesn't take away from the social interactions that people can encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, education. Education levels are increasing tremendously. A college degree now is equivalent to a high school degree a generation ago. So definitely education is significantly increasing in today's society and will in the future. As well as for jobs for women, I think that women are just becoming so, they're developing, they're growing as individuals in the workforce, as well as just being higher up in jobs and careers. So that's really excellent <laughs> to hear about and to see. Great. I did mention yet that I met Natalie when she was a student at the Lewis School in Princeton. Yes. And that is a very important part of your life too, isn't it? Part of your life story. Very important, yes. The Lewis School, I was there for five years, so it had a big impact on my life. And you told me that you learned to not only help yourself, but to try and help others, that that was part of what you came away with. That is correct. I'm being a learning different student. I had to fend for myself and really grow and see what I needed help in and what I struggled in and be independent. And that helped me reach out to others and other students and help them cope with the same problems and struggles that I did as an individual in school always. And I bring that with me to USC, so that's really great. I'm really glad I went to the Lewis School. It's an amazing experience. I'm glad. I, I like teaching there, as a matter yes. of fact. Yes, I enjoy <laughs> the students immensely, yes. Um, also at USC, you mentioned that you were studying gerontology. They have a famous school of gerontology at USC. And I, I can't remember how long ago, <laughs> went to a, took a gerontology um, workshop there in USC wow. some, a long time ago. I was long before I ever considered myself a senior. <laughs> and and uh, was eye-opening, absolutely mm -hmm. eye-opening. <clears throat> what I like about our discussion <clears throat> is that the many things that you care about, you're interested in, apply to people of any age. Right. It's a human, it's a human issue, it's a human concern, and that's what I have found enjoyable 
talking with you. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, other people of your generation think this way? Do you know other people of your generation who think about these things? Well, the Davis School of Gerontology is fairly new, and it's an up-and-coming field. I mean, the, the adult population is increasing as we speak. I mean, that's excellent. People are living longer. They're living better, healthier lives, and that's great to see. As in, in terms of my generation, if people think that way, well, you know, when I tell people, oh, I'm in a gerontology class, they don't even know what that is. They don't know it's the study of aging. So I think people think about what it's going to be like as they age, but I don't know if they're particularly paying close attention to mm. the older lives of adults today and the struggles that they're going through and how they can better their lives. I don't know if that's mm. really something that people are thinking about, but I love studying it. I'm telling you, I'm in a class right now, an online class, and it is phenomenal. I learned so much, really. It's interesting. I, I, in one of my yoga classes, you know that I do lots of, <laughs> lots of things. I do yoga, I do yes. tai chi, <clears throat> and I love walking outdoors, and I mm -hmm. love ping pong. But uh, in my yoga class, there was a woman, and uh, recently we talked to each other after class, and I could see that she looked sad. Yes. And she told me, does anyone know how hard it is now that she is... Uh, retired. She was a social worker, so she had been a person who cared about others. She's right. a widow. Her child or adult children are li living very far away, and she's experiencing this terrible loneliness. Right. And she wonders if other people are experiencing it. And, and so we talk, yes, yes, it's true. It's very, very true. And this business of loneliness is so important to our right. mental health, to our physical health. It's key. It's critical. What can we do, uh, Natalie, to, to address this need? Well, let me say she is not alone in being alone. <laughs> right. Because right. being alone is such an issue and such a problem for older adults. Right. I actually learned that volunteerism, yes, that's a word, from my gerontology class, volunteering is one of the best things that older adults can do to help put off and prevent dementia and Alzheimer's. That one-on-one -on -one connection and also helping younger children, helping younger children develop and just learn. Older adults are so wise and knowledgeable and we learn so much from them. So I think that's super important for her to be involved in the community, do whatever you can teach. Teaching is so important. It's such a skill and the teacher learns and the student learns. So it's a Back That's and right. forth type of... That's right. We used yeah. to say that when I was a graduate student at the Bank Street College of Education, very progressive school in New York, we used to say, to teach is to learn. That's so true. And that's the yeah. exciting thing, that somebody can tell you something that you don't know. Right. You share with them, but they share with you. And it's a very wonderful thing about teaching. Yes. I looked at this <clears throat> New York Times um, op-ed piece by Frank Bruni the other day. <coughs> It's called Dear Millenniums, We're hmm. Sorry. And what he's saying is that the country's slowness to deal with swelling seas and melting glaciers is just too, a one manifestation of our myopia <coughs> and the metaphor for the failure to reckon with the future that we're visiting upon today's children. So the environment is a, is a concern, isn't it? It's an important concern. What, where do you see the, the problems? You know, that, that's a hard question because I talk with so many people and some people say, oh, in 100 years, New York will be underwater. What do you think of that? And it's, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I won't be around. I don't know what will happen. But I think that a lot of people are reaching out and they, are, they do see this. They see that the environment is hurting and struggling and people are bu uh, buying hybrid cars and trying to recycle and they're doing little things to help s put off the uh, negative environment issues that are going on or slow them down at least. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any things we can be doing? I mean, there's more here. He talks about uh, the la lack of jobs, uh, mm -hmm. jobs being replaced by technology or robots. Right. And, um, Gen generational opportunities 
which crunched uh, May's employment figures to confirm a much higher rate of joblessness among American ages 18 to 29 than among the whole population. So we have uh, problems. You're handed a world that you didn't ask for. Right. But that's true of all of us. Right. We all were handed a world that we didn't ask for, whether it was through wars or economic yeah. downturns. We all have to come. That's why I'm a sociologist, <laughs> because I right. understand the importance, right. the importance to the individual, life mm -hmm. for the individual and for the society. And you can't really disassociate the two. No, because it's interesting to think about, oh, I wonder what it would be like living in the early 1900s or 18... But you know what? It wasn't meant for me to be placed there. You just have to look at where you are and the issues going on around and just try to make a difference as an individual and try to teach others and just envelop a community that can help um, ultimately with the, the issues today. Where do you think your wisdom came from? I mean, obviously you have a lot of wisdom. Where do you think it sprang from? Oh, that's, that's a hard question. I, I love this quote, I am all that I have met. I learned that actually at the Lewis School in, in um, really? one of the literature classes, yes. And I think it's so true because there's not one place that I learned all of my knowledge or one pr specific person that taught me what I know today. It's just little pieces of everyone that I've met and interacted with. Of course, positive and negative. You know, you go into people, oh, you know, I don't want to be like that, or I don't want to think that way. But if you didn't interact with them, you'd never know. Mm -hmm. And you and I both agree how important education is, correct? Yes, we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, it's an embattled state at the moment, isn't it? And people are fighting over what should education give, what should it produce, more tests, less tests. Well, if you were to design an educational system, what would it, you know, in your, in your imagination, what would it be? What would it have? That's so hard. I learned so differently than everyone, anyone I've ever met. Oh, gosh, it's, I love the Lewis School, how they have small class size, and even USC, the class sizes are really small. The interactions with the professors and the teachers is really important. I think that I've always sat front and center People have made fun of me. I don't care. That's the way I learn. So I've always been that way. I just think that knowing and having a personal relationship with the professor and teacher is most important because you learn so much more than just what you're learning in the class, an hour or two hours or three hours that you're sitting there. You know, um, I it's think... A, it's a human connection, isn't it? Human connection, yes. Yeah. And um, I think that testing is very important, even though I'm not the best test taker myself. I think it is important. I don't like multiple choice. I really don't like multiple choice. I think that it's better to be able to, you know, write your mind and short answers are very good. And essay writing is always very good for the creative mind. But I just really like how the Lewis School um, teaches and also the University of Southern California. It's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, and I think that's really important. So do you have meetings with your professors in their mm -hmm. office? You do have that? Yes, office <laughs> hours, my favorite thing. <laughs> I'm always there. My professors know me. Natalie, the diver from New Jersey, and that's fine. I'm fine with that. That's just what mm -hmm. I want. So you take advantage of that. Take advantage of mm -hmm. all the, everything, yes. Mm -hmm. I remember I was an undergraduate at the University of Iowa. I was mm -hmm. from New York, so that was already a culture shock going out to the Midwest. Right. And uh, mostly at the beginning, it was these huge classes, these huge lecture halls where the professor right. would speak into a microphone, and you couldn't even see what their face looked like half the time. And then it was a lot of multiple choice tests. I just found this. I didn't really feel I was getting much. I wasn't happy no. with it. Mentioned it to another student. I wish I could remember who they were, but I don't. And she said, well, why don't you get into the honors program? I said, well, what's that? Well, it's small groups, seminars, mm -hmm. lots of papers, and so forth. So I got in. <clears throat> and it was the best part of my education. Good. There were only wow. something like 12 students in the group. We would always debate and discuss whatever. Lots of reading assignments. And you had to write a dissertation for mm -hmm. your bachelor's degree. 
Uh, and at the end, the professors all interviewed you about your experience with the program. And I told them it was wonderful, and I hoped they would continue it. And they told me, no, we're going to discontinue it. I said, why? Why ever would you do that? They said, well, students think it's too much work. <laughs> That's what the <laughs> world is coming to. <laughs> no, but that's, right. I mean, that sounds like my kind of learning. Mm -hmm. Mine does. too, mine too. That interaction, yeah. being able to read something and not just in one ear out the other, be able to actively engage and discuss with someone. That's how I learn. You know, constantly repeating and learning and testing yourself. You know, what did I just read? What was that about? What was the main topic? So that's always very important. Well, I'm sad that they're discontinuing it. Oh, this was a long time ago. Maybe, yeah, you know. They have it again. Maybe they have it again. I will remind them the next time <laughs> I send them an alumni letter or something like that. Yes. But I think this is terribly important. And anywhere else that I went for my graduate work, it was always seeking out that type of ex learning experience wherever right. I could find it. And I think that uh, most students flower under that type of approach. So the packaging, you know, the, the supermarket packaging in education is something that I find distressing and alarming, and yet more and more it goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, and especially, I mean, a student with a learning difference in, in a public school, they, they'll get lost just not knowing what to do. That's where I was. When I went to the Lewis School. I realized what I had, how to fix it, went on to USC and I fend for my own. If I need something, I, I get it, the accommodation I need or anything. So it's really important to, for students at a young age to understand how they learn because everyone learns differently. So people can make adjustments as they continue and that will ultimately better their education. They'll be able to learn better, which will give them better grades and then off to better universities. So I think that's... Mm -hmm extremely important. I do too. I think we have to <clears throat> keep getting that story out. One of my f fun stories is that I became a teacher, a high school teacher in New York City when I was about 23 years old. And I was assigned, because you couldn't pick where you would go, I was assigned to a school in Brooklyn where the kids wore uh, black leather jackets and they were kind of in gangs and they called me teach. <laughs> <laughs> and <That's> um, <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to teach them, and the Board of Ed made everyone teach the same curriculum. There was no right. di differentiation made. And they wanted me to teach uh, Shakespeare, a Shakespeare play, Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it, and I said to them, hey, kids, <clears throat> how many of you are going out with someone from a different background, a different ethnicity mm -hmm. in your family, and, and your family doesn't like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> they knew what I was talking about. I said, well, Romeo and Juliet is all about that. That's what it's all about. Well, I had mm -hmm. their attention for a while. Then I, they paid attention. Then they paid attention. <laughs> so, you know, the moral of the story is if you could draw a link between their experience and what's in the literature, or what's in the sociology, uh, then they're very motivated because they think that maybe it'll help them understand something more about their lives. So that's an important uh, insight into education, that the things they're learning are not remote from them. They're in some way a part of them, no matter how, you know, whether you're talking about science or mathematics, somewhere there it's somehow connected to who they are and what they are. Right. That was kind of the insight that I always loved. I loved the day that I got their attention. Yes. And that they said, yeah, yeah, we, we are going through that. <clears throat> and they actually wanted to read Romeo and Juliet. Right, because they, they saw that connection. And, yeah. well, you know, if they're dealing with the same thing, I'll read this book and take something out of it. So that's Yeah, those were some good. of my wonderful memories of, of teaching in my early teaching days, and I remember a chairman <clears throat> of the department who, later I was told this, said there's a young girl, he was referring to me, in this mm -hmm. classroom, and then next door to her is someone who's been teaching for 30 years, and the young girl can teach the woman who's teaching for 30 years how to teach. He felt that I understood something about making those wonderful connections and how marvelously well it worked in the classroom. So it was something that I had. I didn't know what it was. I just knew by instinct that this is the way right. to teach. So you, you're interested in education too, aren't you? No, journalism. 
Yes, journalism. Journalism. And you're and ultimately that's teaching people. <laughs> that's true. Kind of. That's true. It's another form of education. Yeah. Right. But I am very interested in helping and helping others. So that's very similar to teaching in a way. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. So wh where do you see yourself heading as time goes on? Um, as time goes on, I would love to be a reporter, either for news or for sports or for entertainment. That, but that's ultimately my goal. So that's teaching the public about um, entertainment, sports, or news, ultimately. Okay. Is there anything you want to ask me? Anything you want to explore with me? As someone who has so much knowledge and who has been there and done that, what advice do you have for someone of my age and my generation? Hmm, I like that. Kind of in touching in all the aspects right. we talked about, anything just that comes to mind. Well, I think perhaps uh, learn, uh, learn who you are, learn what your talents are, learn who you are, and allow yourself to go where it feels right. Don't okay. try to be something that somebody else thinks you should be. Right. But, or because they think, well, if you go in that direction, they'll, you'll find more jobs. Maybe yes, maybe no. Right. But the fact of the matter is there's a core self, and it's from the core self that we, we grow the best if we work with what we have. Mm -hmm. you know, I can remember that at times I left teaching and tried. I worked as a copywriter in advertising on Park Avenue. Oh, um, <clears throat> yes, and um, it was very hard for me because I was supposed to be saying good things about terrible things. <laughs> So that's <laughs> that was very hard for me. Right. I just couldn't Being deal dishonest. with it. Yeah, and eventually, I I, I was doing volunteer work at night mm -hmm. after the job, working with children in a, a hospital, in a psychiatric hospital near where I lived, and I would come out of there at the end of the evening feeling really good, feeling really happy, like yes, that that feels right. right. And then one day I said to myself, "Go back to teaching." <laughs> You wanted glamour. Now you've seen. Gl now you've had glamour. You've had glamour, and it <laughs> wasn't what you thought. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't as much right. fun as I thought it would be. So I did, and I actually went back. Uh, I took a job in a on the Lower East Side, in a, it was a fifth grade. I, my license allowed me to teach fifth grade in the elementary school, mm -hmm. and uh, kids who had been so difficult apparently that the, a teacher would quit every month on them. Oh boy. <laughs> so <laughs> by the time I walked in it was like well what am I going to do here and I figured out if I brought in a little hand puppet and talked to them with the hand puppet that might engage them. Well it did. Yeah. It certainly did and they, um, I taught them to make puppets, to put on puppet shows for the s entire school. Mm -hmm. So the worst kids in the school became the most famous. And that was a very wonderful story. It was a wonderful time for me. Then I went on to teach again at the higher, mm -hmm. at the higher levels. Now I'm a college professor, but to me so it's not a, yes. You've seen it all. You've been, yeah. been there. <laughs> right. Done all kinds of, taught all kinds of ages. So yes, yeah. A lot of experience with that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I never cease to find a student interesting. There's always a source of human there, human to discover and understand, and that's the part that's so wonderful, to get them to open up, to communicate, to right. understand themselves. I mean, that's to me the, the, real, the real joy of, of teaching. To find your purpose. Yeah. Everyone has a purpose, yeah. you just have to find it. Right, right, and it mm -hmm. feels so good to have a purpose. Yes. Would be very hard for me not to, mm -hmm. very, very difficult. And I get the sense, Natalie, in talking to you that that's where you are, that you're saying, I want to have purpose. That's exactly where I, yeah. where I am. I want, I'm searching still, but I think right. I'll find a purpose soon. Right now my purpose is diving and helping and being a student, but ultimately later in life I want to find that pur purpose and passion that I'm meant to, meant to do in, in, the, in the world. So, yes. Well... But, Time will tell, huh? Yes. <laughs> Time will but one quote I really love is, what? 
if you fear, if you don't fear your dream, it's not big enough. And I love that. Wow. Yeah. Now that's something to think about. What does it mean to fear your dream? What? I guess fear in a way of if you think it's impossible. If you let your dream tell you you can't do it. Or if you let someone else say, you know what? I don't think you can do that. You know, don't let someone else tell you you can't do it because there's endless possibilities. And you just, yeah, you have to work. It's not going to be handed on a silver platter, or at least not for me, but that's not okay. Yes, right. I don't want it if it's handed on a silver platter. I want to work for it because that, at the end of the day, makes me feel like I accomplished something and mm -hmm. that my purpose has been achieved. So you're the true American dream, aren't you? The, per the one who wants to work for something that matters. Right. That's the true American dream. Mm-hmm. We thought it was dead, but it's not, apparently. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. I know. Yes. Is there anything that you'd like to share before we kind of wrap things up? I think we covered um, pretty much all of the, the general topics. Okay. Well, thank you so yes. much, Natalie, for coming today and to sharing this show with me. And I look forward to hearing more and more about you and your accomplishments and what happens to you at USC. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely want to hear from you and we're going to keep on seeing what beautiful things come out of you. Thank you. And thanks for being who you are, Natalie. Thank you. I look forward to telling you more as I grow as a person in life. I look forward to hearing about <laughs> it. Maybe we'll do another show. We'll do another show. Uh, a year from now, or as I jokingly say, a hundred years from now. <laughs> Let me look in my calendar. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was an honor to be here. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. It's a joy to have you. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for coming today to be with Backstory with Joan Goldstein. Goodbye. <laughs>